Welcome everyone. Uh, and today we are happy to have a talk by Professor Eduardo Martin, Martin Martinez, and he will speak about classical versus quantum gravity. Uh, so please start. Hello. Well, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Very happy uh, to give a seminar uh, here. We're going to discuss um, today, hopefully you can see my, my presentation now, right? Yeah. I assume yes. Yes. Uh, perfect. And uh, we're going to discuss today uh, uh, experiments on gravity in use entanglement, uh, which I will explain a little bit more in detail what they are, and uh, how those experiments, if performed, of course, uh, would or would not, what they would, would they would teach us about uh, the quantum nature of gravity? What can we learn about the quantum nature of gravity? Uh, so yeah, the questions that we're gonna discuss a little bit today are the following two. Uh, can the gravitational interaction entangle two masses? Uh, we have two masses that are quantum systems and uh, can the, the quantum degrees of freedom of the two masses get entangled through gravitational interaction and if so, if we could observe that kind of experiment, uh, kind of experimental fact, what does that mean about the quantum nature of gravity? Okay, so just to summarize a little bit uh, the literature on this, uh, I'm gonna talk about a particular experiment, but in general, this will refer to all the families that exist about gravity induced entanglement. This, will, this is probably the most famous one, which is called the BMV experiment. That is goes for Bose and then Marleto Vedral, the BMV. And the idea is the following. Uh, they have two masses, and these two masses can be put in a superposition of two different trajectories. And uh, these two masses, right, that are prepared in a superposition of two different trajectories can interact with each other only through the gravitational field in the experiment. And uh, the idea is that if the two masses start initially in that state, which is, again, uh, uncorrelated, completely uncorrelated product state of a superposition of mass one going into different trajectories and mass two going into different trajectories, then the final state of the interaction and the interaction they consider is just a Newtonian, we can, we will argue a little bit about that, a Newtonian interaction between the masses, uh, the Newtonian potential gets the two masses entangled. And in fact, one can compute what the final state is, which is this one, which is not separable. And the claim here is, uh, well, we're we going to follow the logic in the claim, in the original claim, or at least my understanding of the logic uh, on the original claim. And then we discuss a little bit um, the, you know, the, the details and the, we'll pick on the, on the nitty-nitty details of the, of the interpretation that is given. So the idea is the following. Okay. So if, if you do this experiment, if you prepare these two masses in a superposition of two paths and uh, you allow them to interact through the gravitational potential, then the logic that they follow in this paper and many others is the following. Well, if the experiment is done and there's entanglement between the masses, then the argument goes as follows. Well, LOCC is so in local operations and classical communication cannot increase in time between the, between the two quantum systems. Thus, if the masses interact only through the gravitational field, and therefore they get entangled through it, the gravitational field, which mediates the interaction, is somehow going beyond the classical communication part. That's the idea. Uh, hence, the field cannot be classical because it's establishing a quantum channel uh, I, I, between the, the state of the two masses here and the state of the two masses here. So there is entanglement creation, gravity establishes a quantum channel, gravity is not LOCC, therefore the gravitational field should go beyond this, should be quantum. That is more or less the idea. Now, this is complemented by these two, by uh, several theorems that are proved in these two papers, uh, in more details in the PRD, of course, which is, well, if there's a third system that locally mediates an interaction between systems one and two, you have two quantum systems, say one and two, and one and two can get entangled, and the interaction is mediated by a third system, then the intermediary system has to be quantum. So this logic put together is what is typically used to talk about, well, gravity-induced entanglement, if found, would be proof of the quantum nature of gravity. Summarizing a lot. Uh, please feel free to interrupt me if there are any questions. It's much better that the questions are asked as I go conceptually, because we're gonna be, uh, building up on the on the concepts. So if there's anything to clarify, please feel free to interrupt me anytime. My talk is going to be probably not taking the whole hour anyways. OK, right. can you yeah. uh, like explain yeah. in that computation that you already showed us, uh, 
So they yeah. understand correctly that they don't get entangled, right? Because you have the classical computation. This is a, this actually get, they get entangled. Uh, yeah. They do get a, so what they have is they have the two masses interact through the the. This is the spatial degree of freedom of the two masses, but it could be done with spins too, and they interact through this Newtonian potential. You can tell the Newtonian potential has the the central mass position here, uh, if you want, uh, for the two masses, and this is uh, uh, there's a Hilbert space for the position of the masses, and in the end they end up undergoing interaction through this potential. They get the two systems entangled. But so they do true, but, yeah. uh, like this expression is completely classical, this gamma and one and two over R. It looks like a classical uh, Newtonian. Uh, I agree, and we're going to get into that. You see, let me put it like this. The claim in these papers is, well, they would argue, that, uh, we, we, and we will get into that, but just to advance it a little bit, they would argue that this is just a limit of, of something, and they would argue that, well, even if this potential, if it can get the two masses entangled, then uh, uh, this has to be that gravity is quantum, and the arguments are these, right? So the, the idea is this. I agree with you 100% that it's a Newtonian potential. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I'm going to tell you that there's nothing quantum about, about the field here to get the two entangled, but they would claim there is. You see that this is important to understand. The claims in these papers that I'm talking about here, let me just lay out all the claims, is, uh, is that the system, uh, the, the gravity has to be quantum. So the claims are used in these two papers. It is claimed, and in this change of papers, it is claimed that finding entanglement, even if the calculation is done with a Newtonian potential, means that gravity has to be quantum. That are, those are the claims. Whether you believe them or not, that's a different story, but those are the claims made in the paper. And the logic goes like this. So let me, we can discuss the logic. It's like, well, gravity, the gravitational interaction is creating entanglement between the two masses. And they would argue, well, you see, entanglement cannot increase under LOCC. Uh, and the interaction, there's an assumption here that the interaction of the systems with gravity is local. And they say, well, if the masses interact only through the gravitational field and they get entangled, then the gravitational field, which is mediating the interaction, has to go beyond the CC part, the classical communication part of LOCC. Hence, the field cannot be classical because it's establishing a quantum channel. And the other two theorems here is that, well, if you have an intermediary system that between that is mediating an interaction between two systems one and two, something that uh, a system C, A or one interacts with C and two interact with C, and through that interaction, you can get the two systems entangled, then the, they prove here that the intermediary system has to have quantum degrees of freedom. That is the claim so far. And I agree with you, this calculation is Newtonian. And it, Saying that a Coulomb potential can entangle is no proof of that the electromagnetism is quantum. I would agree with that. But they are saying, well, but if you find entanglement mediated by it, then yes, it's telling you something about gravity being quantum because uh, a system that is classical cannot mediate entanglement creation. This is the argument. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, but maybe could you remind, please, uh, like how do you see from there that uh, the states got entangled? Like what, what computation? Well, they just, what they did here in the, this calculation is evolve under time evolution. You start with this system that is separable, it's a product state, and you evolve it under the gravitational potential. You have the gravitational field created, it's a potential, it's a Coulomb potential. And of course, the Coulomb potential. Uh, here would be different depending on, so you say if you have one path, you have one Coulomb potential or gravitational potential in this case. If you have another path, you have another gravitational potential. Now I have a superposition. I can just operate with a potential uh, V of R, which is this thing, this phi that you have here. And the unitary evolution generated by that potential uh, is this one. So you get the two systems entangled. This is just a calculation of time evolution. Is the time order exponential of uh, the Hamiltonian that is given by this kind of Coulomb potential. That's the the calculation they do in in both both at all is just that they don't do anything else. Yeah, yeah okay, but uh, just about the definition. How do you see from the final expression that uh, it's uh, got entangled? This is ah are... oh okay. Well, it's not a separable state. It's not. It cannot be written as a product of oh, a product. system one. Oh. Times, it's, a, it's a sum of two products rather. Yeah. Sorry about that. I misunderstood the question. Oh okay. And the last thing. What do you mean by locally? Uh, you mean when we get here, right? Right. So uh, by locally means that A interacts with one and it's a local interaction that does not involve. Uh, so for example, imagine you have a, a third system, system three that is mediating the two. By local here, they mean 
And I will explain the notion of locality later on because there's, in my opinion, a, a bit of a confusion on the notions of locality when these arguments are made, so we'll talk about it. But the notion of locality they talk about here is that system one interacts with the mediator C and uh, there's no operator regarding two in that interaction. Then system two interacts with system three and there's no part about system one um, that in that interaction. So it's about the fact that one interacts with C and two interact with C, but one and two never interact directly. One interacts only with C and two interacts only with C. And the logic they follow is more like intermediary system. You have system A, A interacts with C, C travels to B in a way, and then interacts with C. That's the idea of locality that we're talking about. Okay. Although I will get more into detail about locality later oh, okay. on. Okay, thank you. No problem, yeah. Okay, so here's the here are the questions that one can can wonder, right? Uh, there, so is gravity an intermediary system, or by assuming something about gravity being an intermediary system, are you making a hidden assumption? This is what we're gonna discuss a little bit. Now, the answer typically here is like, well, of course, gravity. They would tell you, and they go about in those papers. Well, of course, gravity has to be an intermediary system because if not, the interaction would be non-local. And we're talking in the sense of locality that I just mentioned. They would say, well, mass one couples to the field and then the field carries quantum information in order to get them entangled, right? The mass one has to couple to the field. Then the field carries quantum information to mass two or otherwise we will have non-locality or action at a distance. It has to be the case that uh, there's some intermediary system. That would be the argument. Or the one you get something like action at a distance. All right, so these are these are the arguments and I hope that this is clear. Those are the arguments or a summary that I made of the arguments in that literature that I, that I talked about in gravity mediated entanglement. Now, let's discuss the notions of locality. So, I'm gonna, I'm gonna discuss two notions of locality that are different in principle. One is what I call event locality here. Event locality is operations happen at events in space-time, whatever that is, and do not affect other events which are causally disconnected from them. For example, relativity will give you a notion of event locality, but you can think of notions of event locality beyond relativity itself. Uh, the point of this is that, sorry, that uh, event locality is related with, you cannot be cause of other events, if you, uh, if you cannot affect other events, if you don't have any causal connection with them. So in the case of relativity, the notion of event locality is related to the fact that, well, space-like separated events cannot influence each other. Now, there's another notion of locality that is used often uh, with the same word as locality, which is what, I, what we call here system locality. And when we particularize system locality to quantum mechanics, this means that operations that independently affect two quantum systems must be separable. That's the point. So if you have a, an operation that you do in on a global system and it's two individual operations that cannot affect system A or system B, you should be able to decompose the action into some tensor product of the action on the first system and action on the second. Now, these two notions of locality are different. And in fact, one of them is fundamental and the other one is operational. Uh, the first one is a foundational principle of physics uh, that is very... If you relax locality, event locality, you better have a good reason for it. It's a very fundamental principle in physics. The fact that, yeah, operations that uh, cannot, uh, that are causally disconnected have to be independent. Whereas the second is an operational notion in the sense that, well, how do I express in the Hilbert space of states, imagine, of, of a quantum system, how do I express operations that I do in lab one, but that not affect, does not affect lab B? It's an operational notion. It doesn't come from a first principle notion. And they are two different notions of locality. Now, the, the two notions are in general independent. There's one theory or one framework, if you want, where we link the two. This is when we do QFT. When we're doing QFT and we have the axiom of microcausality, we are actually linking the two notions. We are saying that, sure, uh, the notion of event locality imposes a notion of system locality between elements of the algebra or exponentials of the algebra uh, of observables of the quantum field that are space-like separated, for example, when you impose a notion of an action of microcausality. So the only framework, the only framework that we know of, that we work with, where the two notions are linked, uh, the notion of quantum system locality and event locality is when we do QFT. 
So it's a bit of a trap then, because if you assume locality, if you are making arguments about locality, that you system locality, and you want to identify uh, this with that notion, fundamental notion of event locality, you may have an issue because you may be using a framework where it is already assumed that you're working with a QFT. But hopefully we will discuss that later too. Um, any questions so far about this? Uh, I want to ask, so when you say micro-causality, you just mean that uh, operators commute? At... That's right, yeah, yeah. And That's the right. second, uh, well, notion of locality, isn't it related to what's called, uh, I think, cluster decomposition? Maybe. That's true, that too. I just wanted to be simple. You're right, yes, I agree. Uh, the point being that the only, the only uh, framework, the important point here is that the only framework where the two launches of locality are linked, mathematically linked, is QFT. That's all that I wanted to say. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay, so I'm gonna give you now two descriptions for the experiment, for the BMV experiment. One that I'm gonna call quantum control field, and another one I'm gonna call, call quantum field. First, I'm gonna give you a hand wavy argument for the, for the models, and then we will discuss a little bit better the relationship between the two models, and, and, and we'll see in a second, hopefully, what I mean. So let me give you an example of, a, of an interaction that is event local, but not system local. So we're gonna discuss this gravity-induced entanglement experiment from the point of view of a model that I'm gonna give you that is gonna be not quantum, or at least I'm gonna argue is not quantum, but still is local in the relativistic sense. So let's consider weak gravity, because of course, two masses that you prepare in the lab in a superposition is not gonna be strong gravity for sure. So you can consider that you are in flat space-time with a small perturbation. Now that small perturbation, of course, is sourced, it's a green function, a radiation green function. It's sourced by the stress energy density of the distribution of masses that you have. Now, if you have only one mass, say, if you have one upper mass, if you have two masses, forget about quantum superpositions of anything yet. If you couple a small mass to it, this is the stress energy density. It's a point-like mass that is uh, going on a time-like trajectory. And this is the stress energy density that would source the gravitational field or the H mu nu, the gravitational perturbation. And uh, what about if you have two masses in some quantum superposition, right? Like in these experiments of gravity induced entanglement. Well, yeah, you don't know. There's no, there's no recipe here as to what to do in the sense that it is not consistent to couple a quantum system to a classical one. So you have to make choices. And uh, let me give you the most naive one. I'm gonna prescribe the interaction very naively as the following. I'm gonna associate uh, to, the, to each state of the particles. Here's the state of the particles is what trajectory they're following, whether they're going on the left or on the right. So I'm gonna say that the interaction is gonna be given by the classical field generated by each particle and they're going each path. So my Hamiltonian is gonna be, you see, if it were only one path, like uh, no superposition, the Hamiltonian would be, yeah, uh, the, two, uh, the two masses are interacting, I, are sourcing a gravitational field through the stress energy density, and they interact through the field they're creating. There's a classical field theory here. Now, the problem is that we have superposition. So what we do is, well, let's add to the Hamiltonian a sum of terms, a matrix elements, depending on, a, for each part of the, you see, this is an incoherent, if you want, superposition of the potential created by each of the paths that you can pick for the particles. So you see, you have the projectors over the state of the path of the two particles, and then the path one could be left or right, path two could be left or right. And uh, this is the gravitational potential, if you want, the gravitational field created by uh, the choice of path P1, P2. So this is just uh, the most naive way, if you want, of writing this interaction. I say like, well, I have a classical field theory. Hold on, it's not going back. I have a classical field theory that tells me, given a stress energy density, tells me uh, what the gravitational field will be through the green function associated to uh, the gravitational field. And of course, we can couple, we know how to do it if the masses go on different paths. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write the interaction as the sum of the projectors of the definite paths times the field that they generate. Now, this may be very naive, may very made up, and we will discuss it. But if you actually compute time evolution through it, which is very simple, it's a classical field theory, uh, only that you have a sum of terms. Uh, each of them is what it corresponds to a classical field theory. 
But this is something that indeed recovers the Newtonian interaction in the non-relativistic limit. When you take that the trajectories of the masses are, um, are non-relativistic with respect to each other, uh, you can recover the, very easily the non-relativistic limit. So this certainly has, this is what they use in the, um, in the description of the experiment that I just gave you in those papers. This is a model which is classical field theory, but coupled need to quantum masses. And this model indeed does reproduce the Newtonian potential is if you want a relativistic version of this one. In fact, you can write this model as a theory with a quant it's like having retarded like wigner eckhart potential, like retarded potentials that uh, uh, basically mass number two takes a while to see the action of mass number one because the action propagates through the gravitational field at the speed of light. So yeah, this model, uh, it's a model, again, that, again, as a Newtonian, as a non-relativistic limit, it has this model, uh, there is the Newtonian potential, but it's a model that describes the interaction of the two masses through, if you want, relativistically retarded potentials. Uh, and we will discuss more what relationship this has with a proper QFT, if we ever go to do a QFT. But I hope that the model is clear. If not, please do ask any questions about it. Uh, is it true that this is essentially just a Feynman exchange diagram, but on the external lines, you have some kind of a mixture of states? Kind of, only that it's not a superposition in the same, it's not a sum of amplitudes, it will be a sum of probabilities, if you want, right? Of modulus square of diagrams, rather. We will discuss that more in detail, um, uh, because I will actually write the Q, what do you need to do to a full QFT in order to become this? That would be, that would be at some point in the talk, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, uh, okay, we're going forward. There you go. Under this evolution, I'm not going to write the computational details. Uh, later on, I will show you the density matrices and so on. But under, under this evolution, the system of two masses evolved to an entangled state. So I wrote here an entanglement measure. This is a, an entanglement measure is negativity in particular. And this entanglement measure is a function of these deltas. As you can tell, these deltas are related to uh, propagators. Uh, this, delta, this delta here is an integral of the contraction of the stationary densities of the two masses uh, in each path, right? And then uh, with the uh, radiation propagator, which is the retarded plus the advanced propagator. So again, it's a classical field theory, nothing sort of classical linear field theory, nothing very surprising. But yes, indeed, the masses get entangled. And surprisingly, we already knew that with the Newtonian potential, which is an approximation to that, they got entangled. So of course they would get entangled here. So yeah, there is entanglement in the two masses when they interact through this interaction that I prescribed. Now, here's something interesting about what I just told you. So this evolution does indeed establish a quantum channel between the masses. That is uncontroversial, it gets them entangled. However, the field here has no quantum degrees of freedom whatsoever, because you see, the only quantum degrees of freedom here are the masses, the path of the, the if you want the center of mass degrees of freedom of the masses. There's nothing about the gravitational field, the H that I wrote here has no hats. There's no Hilbert space for the gravitational field here. There's a Hilbert space for the degrees of freedom of the masses. And of course, the dynamical variables of the gravitational field which are functions over phase space, they do depend on the positions on all the masses. So in a way, the field is not quantum in itself. There's no quantum degrees of freedom, but it's acquiring some notion of quantumness if you want, because uh, the masses are quantum themselves. The masses, the operators have, you have operators here. You have Hilbert space representations of the degrees of freedom of the masses. And because of that, even though uh, the, uh, uh, the, the field doesn't have quantum degrees of freedom, well, now it's dependent on variables that are associated with operators in a Hilbert space of the center of mass of the, of the two masses moving. Now, finding entanglement on the masses through the gravitational interaction does not mean that gravity has local quantum degrees of freedom. Again, I have not done a quantization map whatsoever on the gravitational field. I have not done a canonical quantization. I have not done path integral quantization. There is no quantization being performed in the gravitational field. Now, the interaction, and this is important, is not system local. Same as with the Newtonian potential, right? With the Newtonian potential, in the end, you're having an interaction of uh, the position of mass one and the position of mass two as a contact interaction. Uh, so it's not system local. It doesn't satisfy 
this hypothesis that Marletto uh, and Bedral had, which is there's an intermediary system C that interacts locally with A, and then C interacts locally with B. That's not happening in this model. This model, A and B interact directly through the retarded potentials that the gravitational field establishes. Now, because I'm doing a relativistic theory here and we have the retarded potentials, the interaction is even local. There is no action at a distance. This model is relativistic. Um, nothing propagates faster. The action of mass one over mass two propagates at the speed of light. Again, it's coming from the radiation propagator that has support in three plus one D flat space time has support only on the light cone. So this interaction is local in the relativistic sense or in the event local sense that relativity gives, but yet it's not system local in the quantum sense. You do have direct operator of mass one multiplying direct operator of mass two instead of having an operator of mass one times field operator and then mass two times field operator. There's no field Hilbert space here. So the field, what, is do, what the field is doing is establishing a retarded potential um, that uh, get the two direct potential contact interaction between the two masses. But of course, still uh, even local because we're talking about a theory that's relativistic. So the point that I'm making here with this slide is that an interaction that establishes a quantum channel doesn't mean that there is a quantum system mediating the interaction and can still be even local. So you cannot make an argument, well, but if you don't assume there's an intermediary, then uh, you are violating locality. No, I can still not violate the locality that matters, which is the event locality notion. I am violating system locality. I am certainly having a system A directly interact with the system B, but through a retarded potential that is implemented that is also event local. So the message that I maybe want to transmit here is that the fact that an interaction can establish a quantum channel between two masses doesn't mean that it's mediated by a quantum system per se. And it doesn't mean that it violates event locality either. Does that make sense, hopefully? Okay. Can, can you maybe give a definition? What do you mean by establishing a quantum channel? Yeah, getting it. So by establishing a quantum channel is that uh, uh, for the purpose of this talk, getting something entangled. Uh, for example, if you get to if you get to quantum systems that initially are not entangled, then you do some operation. A quantum channel is just a CPTP map, if you want to see it like that. It's something that maps physical states to physical states, density matrices to density matrices. Now, if I start with a state that is not entangled, and I do some process, and that process is a CPTP map, so it's like we call that a quantum channel in general. And that process get the two um, get the two uh, masses entangled. There is no way to describe that process with classical channels. And classical channels are the following: are classical channels is channels that can be described by LOCC. And let me give an example, perhaps to clarify. A classical channel uh, is something that I'm allowed to do something locally on system A. I can touch system A and do whatever I want with it. any unitary or even non-unitary. I can do any uh, any uh, CPTP map on system A. I can also do a CPTP map on system B. They have to be local in the sense that they only contain operators for system A and system B. What I'm doing on system A doesn't depend on system B, uh, doesn't have operators of system B. However, I am allowed to communicate. I am allowed to do things on system A and then talk with the person operating system B and say, I have done this, can you, use the information that I've done this to do something there and create classical correlations. Like for example, I'm gonna rotate pi over two this spin here. And you say, okay, if you rotated pi over two, I'm gonna rotate my minus pi over two. This kind of operations, coordinating, uh, doing local operations that are coordinated and allow for communication between the two. For example, the first one could measure, make a measurement and send the outcome of the measurement to system B. Those is what I would call classical channels. Those channels are the channels that are described by LOCC. However, if you can create entanglement, it cannot be, this is a theorem, if you can create entanglement, if a quantum channel, if a channel, so some CPTP map be, uh, of a bipartite system creates entanglement, then it cannot be described as with LOCC, with local operations and plus classical communication. And that is typically using quantum information theory as a signature of quantumness. There's something quantum going on. Does that make sense, hopefully? Yeah, okay, thank you. Perfect. So what I'm arguing here is that establishing a quantum channel itself, sure, it's cool. You can prove that gravity establishes a quantum channel, 
But that is no proof that gravity has quantum degrees of freedom. It's not talking about gravity having any quantum degrees of freedom itself. Now, um, there's an important distinction. It's like saying, you see, because a Coulomb potential, think of the electro electromagnetic interaction, electrostatic interaction, a Coulomb potential can also create entanglement between two electrons that you prepare in a superposition of, of paths. But that's no proof that uh, you need quantum electrodynamics to describe electromagnetism. This is along, along the lines of what I'm talking about here. Oh, yeah. Now, this was with the, what a model that I call quantum control and, and QC. And the notion of quantum control is because gravity is not quantum. I make no assumptions about the phase space, the nature of phase space, the representation of the dynamical variables of the quantum system. I made no assumption on it. Uh, and the system acquires its quantumness through the fact that the masses are quantum. The, the, well, the, the central mass degree of freedom of the masses are quantum. Okay. Now, let's consider another model. Let's do a model where gravity is actually truly quantum. We have a QFT for gravity. So because it's linear gravity, I can do it, no problem. So I'm going to do a quantization of the gravitational perturbation, H. So I can do canonical quantization and then couple the stress energy tensor of the particles to the quantum gravitational field. This is no problem because, again, it's linear gravity. And of course, no matter what your favorite quantum gravity theory is, one should expect that linear quantum gravity should work in the weak gravity limit anyways, because again, it's the linearization of Einstein equations and uh, I can fully quantize that perturbation, no problem. Okay, so that's what we do. We put hats on the H's and now look at this. I have here a Hamiltonian density, coupling the masses with the field and this Hamiltonian density is related to, uh, so this uh, the, is the field operator, H mu of X, this is a field now, you have one degree of freedom per point in, uh, in space and it's coupled to the stress energy density of the masses. So this is the Hilbert space of the masses. So you want an operator in the Hilbert space of the masses, the operator is here, right? And each of the matrix elements of that is the stress energy density associated with the path that you have. And this is the gravitational field. Now, of course, we can get a Hamiltonian integrating, you get a foliation of space-time, your favorite, say, I mean, it's flat space-time, the background is flat space-time, so we get a, a, a canonical foliation with inertial coordinates. And one gets that the Hamiltonian integrating over the spatial sections is given by this. Okay, so now we have a QFT description of the BMV experiment. And we couple, again, the stress energy tensor of the particles to the quantum gravitational field. Okay, so the same setup as we had before, but now gravity is locally quantized. And it starts, and we put it in the vacuum state, Minkowski vacuum state in the far past. And then the masses at some point are introduced there. They uh, excite the gravitational field. They interact locally at uh, where the masses are with the gravitational field. And the interaction is propagated, of course, to the other mass and both interact with the gravitational field. This is a fully quantum field theory description. Now, let me advance the result before discussing a bit more details of the model. Of course, as expected, the two masses get entangled. Unsurprisingly, again, the you see, there are three levels here. There's the Newtonian potential level, then the, the classical field theory level that is relativistic, uh, but still the field is not quantum, if you want. And here's the one that I described the field fully quantum. I have, I have quantized the field. Now, of course, this one should reproduce what the others in some regimes, what the others do in some regimes as well. With this model, the two masses also get entangled. So there's no discussion here. Now, there are Gs here, and we will discuss what the, they are here. There's the Gs here. Uh, the field also, this is very important, the field also gets entangled with the masses. Now, you see how in the, um, in the previous case, you have that the, the entanglement they acquire is function of the propagators only. But here, in the quantum case, when you have a quantum field, sorry, that's going slowly. When you have a quantum field, the entanglement that you acquire, there you go, the entanglement that you acquire has this other term here, which is a noise term. This is a term that is related to vacuum fluctuations. Every mass is vacuum fluctuations, even when the field was in, in vacuum. And that is actually counterproductive to get them entangled. But it's even worse because the masses, of course, they do get entangled with the field. Through the interaction with the field, they don't start, you see the masses and the field don't start in an eigenstate, the masses, certainly, if they are in a superposition don't start in an eigenstate of this Hamiltonian, 
and the masses get entangled with the field. So there's a, bit, there's a difference to begin with, with the model where gravity is not quantized. There is the coherence in each of the masses that we didn't have before. Now, you can tell what, what these Gs are. These Gs are, again, related to, uh, it's very similar to what we had before, if you see. Here, in the, in the classical case, we had this contraction, and this was the radiation propagator in the classical case. In the, well, the QC case, let's not call it classical, the quantum control case, where the field was not quantum. But here, instead, we have the Feynman propagator. What is playing the role, of course, of the radiation propagator here is the Feynman propagator. And uh, of course, the Hyman Feynman propagator can be written as a sum of two contributions. One is the radiation propagator, if you want, in, in the imaginary part. And then there's the, uh, the Hadamard uh, contribution as well, which is state dependent. So in the case of the vacuum, would be the, the Hadamard of the vacuum. So uh, this is what you get when you actually consider the quantum field, the quantum, quantum gravity, sorry, the gravitational field to be quantized, linearized. Uh, the linear perturbation to the gravitational field, if you want, to the metric, gets quantized. Now, we have to compare the two. We have to compare the two models that I had here. The two models I presented as one is uh, the gravitational field has local quantum degrees of freedom. I have a full quantum field theory for the linear perturbation to the metric. And the other one is the quantum control classical gravity. Here, I'm using the same as linearized gravity. But uh, H is a classical field theory. And of course, it's not well defined what to do when you have quantum matter and a classical field theory. But what I do is the most naive way, again, which is, all right, associate to each state of matter the classical gravitational field that it would have generated and sum them incoherently. That is the, the naive model that I have. And both models are relativistic, are uh, even local. Both models predict that the two masses will get entangled. But of course, there are differences between the two. OK, uh, I'm going to move to comparing. Ah, yeah, yeah, there's another difference that I will talk about maybe at the end. Uh, in the quantum field case, you can get the two masses entangled even when they are space-like separated. And we will discuss this a little bit more. This is not by learning causality or anything. This is because the masses can harvest the entanglement that is present in the ground state of the field, because the, the, the vacuum state of the field has entanglement between space-like separated regions. Of course, this is only in the quantum case, and we will discuss this a little bit at the end. Um, let me let me give you uh, a little bit more of because the model that I introduced is pretty naive. One thing that I want to uh, to argue is what is the relationship between the quantum, the full quantum model, and this quantum control QC model that I call. And for that, I need a little bit of discussion, and the discussion is about what is quantum about a quantum field, right? Uh, well, of course, let me do it with a scalar field just to simplify things quite a bit. Uh, one of the key quantum properties of the field, well, is of course the quantization map. The quantization map that maps the Poisson brackets to uh, uh, to uh, to commutators. Well, of course, dynamical functions to op uh, Hilbert space uh, represent as operators in a in a Hilbert space, and also uh, the Poisson bracket to the uh, to the commutator. Now this, let me call it E, the commutator between the field at different events, uh, is certainly a quantum feature of the field, if you want. It's, it's, nobody would say that this is not quantum, I would say. Maybe yes, but I'm going to say that it's quantum. <laughs> what else? All right, let's talk about the, the two-point functions. Uh, we have the Weinmann function, right? And the two-point function of the field. The Weinmann function has two parts. There's the imaginary part, that is the commutator. And there is the Hadamard, that is the state-dependent part. Okay, this is of course quantum as well. You can have quantum states and very qu quantum properties that are in the states, right? If you want, that will go in the Hadamard. And then we have the Feynman propagator here. The Feynman propagator has a state-independent part as well, but this state-independent part is just the radiation propagator. Remember, this is the retarded green function plus the advanced green function. I'm going to call that classical because it appears already. It is. What plays, you know, in the in the classical theory, the, the role of the Feynman propagator is played by the radiation propagator. And of course, you also have the state dependent term, the Hadamard. Now, claim, very hand waving. E and H are quantum in nature. And delta, the radiation propagator, is classical in nature. That's what I'm, I'm saying, in the sense that, well, they're not present uh, in a classical field theory. The, this is the one that's present in a classical field theory. All right, so this has, these are the, uh, the density matrices that one gets. When you interact, you start, imagine, you have 
in this case, because I'm doing scalar field, you have uh, uh, two, uh, if you want, two monopoles coupling to the scalar field. And uh, they start in a separable state. In fact, they start in their ground state. Let's say there are two level systems to simplify. So my monopoles here have an excited state and a ground state. And they start originally in a separable state that is the ground state for, for uh, system one, the ground state for system B, but they interact with the quantum field locally. So they start in, uh, in the same way. The, the density matrix they would start as is one, zero, 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 all zeros and only a one here uh, for the two systems uh, in both cases. And now I'm gonna give the results that one gets when you use the quantum control model, the one that I told you where nothing is quantum about the, the degrees of freedom of, of the field and the one that the field is fully quantized. Now, in the one that is fully quantized, when you get two systems, two, these are what people call unrooted with detectors, in case you want to, uh, in case you know about them already. They are, uh, if you want qubits, so two level systems that couple locally to, the, to a quantum scalar field. Now, the system evolves to this after the interaction with the field. And you see that you have LAA is a noise term, LBB is a noise term. You have L, A, B, and M terms. You can tell that the L is given by integrals if you want. So Fourier transforms, if you want, of the switching function, how long their interaction is on, uh, and the Weibman function. The M terms are given by the Feynman propagators. And uh, this is in the case that the field is fully quantum. In the case that the field is classical, you get this MC or rather than classical quantum control. In the case that the field is quantum control, uh, again, no quantum degrees of freedom in the field. All that I have here is the M terms. And these M terms are very similar to what you get with the Feynman propagator, but it's the radiation green function instead, what you would get. Now, now one can say, can check how do you recover the, the model that I described as naive, right? The one that is, right, get one term with the classical field per configuration of matter in coherent sum of them. So if I cancel all the parts that are quantum, in the, in the um, what I call quantum in the QFT description, you are left, of course, then uh, the terms L cancel. And what you're left is exactly with the same thing. This, this matrix, of course, you have to go to one more order in perturbation theory to get this term, uh, for this term to be there. But you can tell that the two models are related by precisely canceling everything that I deem to be quantum of the QFT. Canceling the commutator artificially and canceling the Hadamard uh, and only be left with the radiation green function. You see, the field doesn't have freedom. The field is completely, completely controlled by the masses. You have sources that are the masses and the radiation green function propagates the action of the masses to the other mass, to everywhere else in space time. So literally the naive construction that I gave you, which is sum the classical field times the projector over the state of matter for all possible states of matter, this is what happens when you remove anything that's internally quantum of the field. Now, uh, uh, there we go. So, uh, yeah, so let, let me make the claim. Maybe I'll, I'll skip this for a second and make another claim. Well, I don't know. Uh, this I will leave in the end. So let's go here. So now I've given you two models. I'm giving you two models and both of them are event local, they don't contravene relativity. They are, one is a, based on a classical field theory, but some for every configuration of matter. And the other one is a QFT, a fully microcosal QFT. Uh, so both of them predict entanglement, okay? And say that somebody does the experiment and finds entanglement now. So these are just playing with math a little bit, with field theories. But let's say that somebody, there's people. So the reason why this experiment is relevant is because it is predicted that in 10 years or so, people would be able to perhaps do these kinds of experiments. People are advancing a lot in, in, in doing both quantum Cavendish experiments and super precise Cavendish experiments. And these two things put together is what you need for a BMV experiment. So imagine that somebody has done the experiment and you are called to give an opinion by the Nobel Prize Committee. And you need to analyze what has been proved, whether they deserved a Nobel Prize or not. Have they proved that gravity is quantum or not? So let me give you my claims. These are my claims, and you can discuss if you want. What does the experiment prove? If you find entanglement, 
only find entanglement and you have you don't know what the regimes of interaction were you just have done you have made sure that you have two masses in superposition and the two masses have only interacted through gravitational field you have isolated your system very well that's not under doubt they only interact through the gravitational field and you found that they start in a separable state and they end up entangled so what does the experiment prove so it proves certainly that semi-classical gravity fails to describe the experiment. No surprise. I mean, of course, with semi-classical gravity, you would not get them. If you just model gravity uh, with semi-classical gravity, just uh, sourcing it with the expectation of T mu nu, then yeah, that will not get the masses entangled. So yeah, the experiment disproves semi-classical gravity. I would say that's not a bit. I mean, it's nice to have an experiment that shows that semi-classical gravity is not correct, but I don't think any theoretician nowadays would think that semi-classical gravity is correct. <laughs> we all know that it's not, I think. Uh, so it's proving something that is relatively uncontroversial in that. So it's, it's nice. I'm not saying it's not nice. It's very nice to have an experiment that is not compatible with semi-classical gravity. I don't think we have observed any experiments like that so far. <laughs> so it's nice. Now, second, it proves that gravity can set up a quantum channel between masses. And again, let me uh, explain as before. This means that it can get the masses entangled. It cannot be whatever gravity is doing, cannot be something that, that is like LOCC, local operations and classical communication. So that would be proof of that. And that's interesting in its own right. Now, opinion. What the experiment does not prove, well, it does not prove that gravity has quantum degrees of freedom. Why? Because I just gave you a model that makes the same prediction, the prediction being that the systems get entangled, not how much and so on. They, they would differ in how much, right? In one, you have quantum noise. In one, you have ability to get space-like entanglement. In the other, you don't. But if all that you see is that the masses have become entangled, which is what they're claiming in those papers, then, yeah, no. You are not proving that gravity has quantum degrees of freedom because I can have a model with that is event local that still uh, assumes no quantum degrees of freedom from gravity and reproduces an entanglement. And also, it cannot prove that there is a quantum. So oftentimes, you will read in these papers that having a superposition of masses create a superposition of gravitational fields, or even things like superposition of space times. I honestly don't understand those claims very well, I have to say. But certainly, no, this is not a proof that you have a superposition of gravitational fields. Look at the QC model. The QC model, what we have, is an incoherent sum of uh, the gravitational field generated by some stress energy density times the projector associated with the masses being in, in that state of in a particular state of motion and then propagated with the classical green function to the other mass this is nothing in my opinion telling nothing about the notion of superposition of the gravitational field to begin with there's no hilbert space for the gravitational field in that model so what is it meant by superposition of gravitational fields there Leave alone superposition of space times. I have no idea what is meant by that. Even this is used in that literature. And I don't think the experiment, if the entanglement is observed, would prove anything along these lines. OK. Let's see. Uh, so I have more things. I can talk about the space-like entanglement and what, what, uh, what uh, the space -like, what are the, how can you modify the experiment to actually rule one model over the other, if you want. But maybe I'll do a summary of what we have so far. And then I'll take some questions and I can talk about space like entanglement later on if there's time because it's like getting closer. So let me give the summary. The detection of entanglement in a gravity-induced gravity -induced entanglement experiment is agnostic to the existence of quantum degrees of freedom in gravity. Unless, of course, one assumes there's a connection between event locality and system locality. But this is already assuming that you start in QFT with a QFT from the start. So it'll be a circular argument if you want. Now, I would claim that there are still differences between the two models, a model that is quantum in nature and a model that is not making assumptions about the degrees of freedom of gravity, which is the fact that you can find space-like entanglement. And I can discuss a little bit why you can get space-like entanglement in case this sounds a bit weird, that you can get space-like entanglement in a QFT. Um, but uh, I will leave that for later. I think I could take questions now. And if there's time after that, I can, I can talk about that a little bit, a couple of slides that I have, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, thank you. Are there any questions? Okay, maybe I can ask you, uh, mm -hmm. can you show uh, where is the H bar? 
in your computation. I didn't Something. write that. I, that's like it's a good idea. So one one thing that would be nice is to actually show that when you make h bar to zero, you get the other one, right? That's what you have in mind. I assume. Yeah. So there's certainly an h bar here. <laughs> mm -hmm. There can be h bars. So I would argue this is not okay. Take this with a grain of salt. But I I would argue there's certainly an h bar here that is undis indisputable. There's also possibilities of h bars in the Hadamard. Because the Hadamar is the state preparation. In the state preparation, if you have a quantum means to prepare a superposition, you're going to have h-bars in the state preparation in general. Uh, there's no h-bar in, in this part of the propagator. So yeah, in principle, one would expect that when you make h-bar going to zero, this term is going to cancel. These terms may or may not cancel. Uh, so that's why I'm telling you it depends, because this is state dependent, right? So it depends because that the h bar would appear there. If you are saying, can I prepare superposition with h bar going to zero? My answer would be no, you can't. But you can assume that you have a superposition. Say, say that I have, I told you, I have zero plus one, one root two, some, some two dimensional Hilbert space, one root two, zero plus one. If I make h bar going to zero there, I still have one, two, zero plus one, right? But the question is like, well, yeah, but in order to prepare the zero plus one, you should have undergone a process where there's some h bar somewhere. So in order to prepare your superposition, you need an h bar. So while it's true that these things don't directly depend on h bar, I would say that in a theory that you take h bar going to zero, yeah, the hallmark of also falls. Definitely the commutator does. <laughs> this one doesn't. That's the classical one. So in that sense, yeah, I would love to claim that when you make h bar go to zero, you recover the quantum control theory from the quantum field theory. Now it's a bit. Uh, bit of a nuisance, a little bit of, uh, of subtleties, right? In the sense of the Hadamard may not have H bars, right? But uh, you could argue that you still need H bar to prepare things that are not classical. Yeah. Question, really good question. I would we'll definitely have thought of that. Uh, and that's why I'm being careful with not making claims about H bar, but, but yeah, no, I agree with you. H bar going to zero should give you the quantum control one from the quantum one, yeah. And that would be really nice, right? Because I think that if you show somebody if they told you an experiment that they claim detects quantum gravity, but you say, well, if I make h bar go to zero, I still get the same prediction. I don't think they could claim anymore that this is quantum gravity, telling much about quantum gravity. Yeah, yeah. very good question. And uh, can you do the same with uh, electromagnetism? I, I think I can, yes. Uh, the idea is that you can, indeed. You can have in electromagnetism. So you see, the, the thing is that nobody in electromagnetism would say that detecting entanglement in a process of electrons interacting through a Coulomb potential is proof that electromagnetism is a quantum. It has to be quantum. Uh, that was never done. And in fact, in the past, the, 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 the route was different. When people started to talk about quantizing the electromagnetic field, um, it was not because, uh, uh, you know, they... they uh, they believe it was quantum and they want to find an experiment that, that does it. It's more like, no, no, we use classical until we can't anymore. And we need genuinely things that cannot be explained by the classical model. So the way it works for that is like, well, there are some things that we cannot explain with classical models. Therefore, we need something else. Here is so different. Here, something is found that, well, entanglement is some genuinely quantum feature of, 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 uh, of, of physics, right? So, right. Maybe entanglement can tell us about gravity being quantum, but you see, if you can still reproduce this with a model that doesn't quantize the field, it's not proof that it's quantum. This, this would be my opinion. And again, yeah, in electromagnetism, you can do exactly the same, but I don't think anybody would be very surprised, right, about that. You can certainly do the same thing with electromagnetism, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but still you have like subtle differences, right, between uh, the result in, in the two cases. So probably totally. tested uh, first for electromagnetism. I mean, I, I, I guess you suggest to do it experimentally, right? That's right. So the idea is, okay, can we instead, so if we go to the two expressions that you have, right? You see that, yeah, they're not the same expression. So certainly the two models make different predictions. So now you need to identify in what regimes the, 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 the predictions are the most different and maybe hope to say, for example, it'd be very nice because in the experiment, people are going to have a hard time showing the amount of entanglement. It's much easier to show there is entanglement, but quantifying it is tough in an experiment. So if you can find a scenario that in one case there's entanglement and the other one there isn't, then you're good. And this is what I was talking about with space-like entanglement, which is more difficult. So maybe I can give the next four minutes. It's a couple slides, so it should be fast. Yeah. We can talk about one of them. 
one modification of the experiment is try to look for space like entanglement. Now, this is tough, right? Because space like entanglement is tough. It's now that we're doing experiments with the electromagnetic field to prove space like entanglement. But the idea is this, right? The idea is based on there's a protocol called entanglement harvesting and relativistic quantum information. And the idea is this think that these are two atoms, think electromagnetic field, two atoms. And this is the size of the atom in this polygon of space time. And this is how long they interact. You put them in Faraday cages, then you open, you close, whatever. So, yeah, here the two atoms start in, in this plane of simultaneity here, in this spatial surface, they start being unentangled in a separable state, in fact, and correlated. Then you switch on the interaction for the first one. And then in light separation from the first one, you switch on the interaction. I can claim these two atoms get entangled and people would not be very surprised because yeah, I mean, atom one interacts with the field here. There's some excitation of the field that propagates here and that atom interacts with it. So for sure, they would get entangled. That would not be surprised, surprising to people. However, my claim here is that you can actually get them entangled if they interact like this. So they interact only for a finite amount of time here, a finite amount of time here. They start in a separable state and they end up in an entangled state. Notice still all causal, meaning that the partial state of atom one, when you trace out B, still has no information about B. Somebody only looking at A will not be able to find out what's going on here. But somebody that receives signals from the two or somebody in the future can do a Bell experiment and violate Bell inequalities. There is some time in between them. How does that happen? Well, this is well known. Maybe if, if, if you are uh, uh, very well familiar with algebraic QFT, then you know already, but just in case, this is a very pedestrian explanation with a very simple example, which is a chain of harmonic oscillators instead of a field. So how do you get two systems entangled? Mind that I give you a problem, which is get system A and B entangled, but I don't allow you to make them interact directly. I only allow you to interact A with I and B with J. And this is a, a chain, a one dimensional chain of harmonic oscillators preparing its ground states. So what are the two possible mechanisms to get them entangled? Well, number one is this. So you interact A with I, then a perturbation is created because of the interaction. The perturbation travels to B, and that's, yeah, communication-based entanglement creation. And of course, this is limited by the speed of sound. You can get the two entangled, and this is limited by the speed of sound. However, there's another mechanism, right? The ground states of, of the lattice has entanglement. We already know that. It, there, there's area law decays of entanglement when you have many body systems interacting at first neighbors. So you can take advantage of that. You see, I mean, this is for done for audiences that probably are not that familiar too. So apologies if I'm explaining something that you already know very well. Of course, the ground state of the lattice of harmonic oscillators is not a product state of the ground states of individual ones. If you compute the normal modes and find the, 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 the least energy normal mode, we know that this is an entangled state. And we know that I and J are entangled in general. And entanglement decays, of course, with some area law. In one dimension, is even constant, which is actually nice. But then what happens is that you can swap entanglement. So you can interact A with I. The interaction looks random for A in the sense that you see noise. A gets excited or whatever in a random way. It's vacuum noise if you want. B too, but the noise is correlated, right? So when they interact with the ground state, they're observing locally noise that they cannot tell, but the noise is correlated, but they can be swapping the entanglement that was contained between I and J. In the simplest case, imagine that I do a swap of the state of I with A and J with B. So in that case, the assistance can get entangled faster than the speed of sound, because of course they're not communicating, they're just gathering the entanglement present in the ground state of the field. The same thing can be done in case, in case you want to read something, there's some old references about it. Uh, and uh, in, in case you want to read about entanglement harvesting. But the idea is that, for example, that's a case. If you can get entanglement, if you can assure that the two masses only interact gravitationally, and the two masses get entangled before there's enough time for a line signal to be transmitted, then sure, this is proof that gravity is a quantum field. You are talking about ground state entanglement. This strong proof that gravity is quantum because it's literally detecting entanglement that is in the field already. So not only you need quantum degrees of freedom for the, for the field, you also need to have entanglement <laughs> in the field, which is an extremely quantum signature. Um, so yeah, that would be a one way of doing it. Uh, there are others. There are some other clever. So the, the one thing is that you can prove that if you are deep in light contact, the quantum C model approximates very well. The, the, the quantum control model approximates the quantum model. Uh, so yeah, in the, in the current experiment proposals that they have the numbers in there, it's not conclusive. 
you cannot prove that gravity has quantum degrees of freedom. But it can be modified cleverly. For example, uh, Wald recently had another take on that, which is using uh, propagation time that is half the light crossing time instead. So one way light crossing time. If you have only one way light crossing time, there are things that uh, that vary very differently if the field is quantum versus the field being classical. So that's another regime that it works. But if you're in a regime that they are in light contact for a long time, the two masses, yeah, that can be approximated by a theory that is agnostic about the quantum degrees of freedom of gravity. And that's the claim. I think that's it. And I got, I consumed the hour. Um, but, uh, is it correct that this uh, this effect of entanglement uh, space like mm -hmm. is exponentially suppressed when you go outside light code? Uh, for a massive field, it would be exponentially suppressed. Suppressed. If it's a massless field, it's polynomially suppressed only. Mm -hmm. Something like one over r. Sorry, I couldn't hear that. Something like one over r. Like, yeah, well, it depends on dimensions of space-time. It would be one, in fact, even in one plus one dimensions, the ability to extract it decays worse than the entanglement itself, because, of course, you cannot fully extract. If you're not clever about it, if you're very clever, you can fully extract on the entanglement. But if you say there's some physical constraints on the couplings that you can do and so on, then you are worse than the, the entanglement decay loss that you have in the, in the system. So, for example, in, for electromagnetic field, in the vacuum, if you are one plus one dimensions, it goes to something like this one over the square root of the distance. In three plus one dimensions, it goes like one over the square of the distance. Mm -hmm. If the field is massive, though, yeah, it decreases exponentially. With the, the mass scale gives you an exponential decay of correlations itself. They die very easily. They also die. Here's another challenge. Those correlations die very fast with temperature. If you consider a km instead of the ground state, you consider a km state, a thermal state of some temperature t, entanglement decays exponentially with that. And that's another issue. You need to be really cold to do these experiments. In fact, it's now that people are trying to do with superconducting circuits. There are several groups doing experiments of entanglement, space-like entanglement harvesting in superconducting circuits. The challenge is that you need to make sure that you can switch on and off the interaction fast enough to guarantee that you're in space-like separation. Uh, that means that you need to separate them at a distance, and when you separate them, the entanglement decays, right? So that is the challenge. You need to make them separated enough to guarantee that you are in space-like separation, but also close enough so that the entanglement doesn't decay too fast. And uh, it's doable. Uh, in fact, people are working in building the machines now. Uh, I know two groups that are working on it, but it's tough, it's challenging. Now, of course, that is with the electromagnetic field. If you consider gravity, that's gonna be even more challenging because the strength is much weaker, so the entanglement you'll be able to harvest is less. So yeah, not saying it's easy, no, of course not. And also, one thing that I want to make sure, I'm not saying the experiment is worthless. Even if you find entanglement, there are things as I have here, right? There are things that you're proving. You, again, it's a very nice experimental proof that semi-classical gravity fails. We already know it has to fail, but I don't think we have observed it yet fail anywhere. In our astrophysical observation, we haven't seen anything that tells us Semi-classical gravity doesn't work. Well, this would be an experiment that shows experimentally that semi-classical gravity is wrong, which of course will surprise nobody, but still it's an experimental proof, right? So it's certainly not useless. I think it's a cool experiment. The claim that it proves that gravity is quantum is what I think is overstated, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Are there any other questions? Okay, it doesn't seem so. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Thank you very much for a nice talk. Thank you. Yeah, it was nice. Uh, thank you for your questions as well. Yeah, and uh, thank everyone for coming and hope to see you next time. <laughs>